The committee is resumed. Members, we move now to the Social Security Fraud Measures and Debt Recovery Amendment Bill. And the question is that Part 1 stand part. Sue Maroney. Thank you, Mr Chair. It's a pleasure to rise and speak to the Social Security Fraud Measures and Debt Recovery Amendment Bill and speak on Part 1 of this bill. Um, well, can I say at the outset that uh, with many, many reservations, the Labor Party is supporting this bill, and Part 1 is where the substantive amendments take place. But I do want to, at the outset, put on record our um, unease with what this bill does represent, because it is one of those, those bills, and, and Part 1 with the substantive amendments, I think, uh, demonstrates this, where the government has been um, all too quick to bring out measures designed to make it look like they're harsh on beneficiaries, and this is another one of those. This is about welfare fraud measures and debt recovery. But the fact remains that actually, if they were serious about fraud measures and debt recovery, that they would go after tax fraud first and foremost, because that is where the vast amount of fraud actually happens in this country. So you know, basically the facts speak for themselves. Relationship fraud amounts to around $20 million a year. The Inland Revenue Department estimates that tax discrepancies amount to over $1.2 billion a year and that annual tax fraud is about $140 million at an absolute minimum. So, Mr Chair, I want to say at the outset that um, while fraud in terms of, um, of the welfare issue is not acceptable, and that's why the, the Labour Party is supporting this bill, it is dwarfed, absolutely dwarfed by the tax fraud that goes on. And we're not taking the same sort of measures. So in part one, the sort of measures that have been taken by the government are around ensuring that where um, the spouse or um, the partner of uh, someone who has committed beneficiary fraud, that they are also, they are also captured um, and, and can be held accountable for that fraud. Now, listen very carefully to the submitters that came before the Select Committee on this, this bill. There weren't very many of them. But what they had to say was really important and, and worthwhile listening to, because I was concerned around some of the gender impacts of part one of this bill. And we did have a number of women's organisations that came forward to support the bill because what they said was that quite frequently in their experience, while the beneficiary themselves was a female and often a sole parent, actually, that they believed that sometimes they had been forced into committing a welfare fraud by their partner. That it wasn't their idea at all, that it was um, a, a, an aggressive and maybe even sometimes a violent partner who was coercing them into committing this welfare fraud. And so um, it was interesting to hear that sort of gender perspective on, um, on part one of the bill because those were women's organisations saying actually they thought that women were unnecessarily shouldering the responsibility for welfare fraud and um, often it was their partners that were actually instigating it to start off with. So we did agree with those organisations but we also agreed with the Law Commission when they came and raised issues with the Select Committee around, uh, around the burden, burden of proof. Because effectively what this, what this bill does, and it does it in part one, is it doesn't have a very high level of the burden of proof of whether the, the partner or spouse of the beneficiary who has committed the fraud was actually at the forefront of that or not. And this is, this is a new precedent that's been set by, by this law. And that's what the Law Commission came to, uh, came to discuss with the Select Committee and told us of their disease about it. And the Labour Party shares that. And in fact, we said so in a minority report on the bill that we have some major reservations about it. And um, we are concerned about the departure from the general principles of criminal law, that a positive act is, not, is normally required to ground criminal liability. And this bill 
for the first time doesn't require that to be established. There's no requirement for it to be a positive act, that the person um, uh, actually was an instigator of it. Rather, it just says they needed to have knowledge of or failure to report, Mr Chair. Sue Moroni. Rather, it just says that they needed to have either knowledge of or a failure to report another's offending um, to, for it to be covered under this bill. And that's normally insufficient to ground criminal liability. But this bill changes all of that, and we are concerned about the precedent that it sets. But I'll say again, Mr Chair, that we would probably be a little less concerned about the precedent that it sets if it was actually applied equally. But as this government's inclined to do, they actually want to take harsher measures against people who are more vulnerable. And people who are committing corporate tax fraud, they really don't seem that bothered about. So they've got loopholes for Africa about what corporate people with lots of resources can do in the area of fraud. But when it comes to people who haven't got so much, then they seem to want to clamp down on them very, very hard. And I think it demonstrates the... Um, the I'm not allowed to use that word. I'm just trying to think of the word that I can use. The one I wanted to use begins with H and I can't use it. But the, the ironic approach, let's say, I'll call it the ironic approach of the government, where they do tend to pander much more to people in our society who have a lot. Let's be frank, they are, ta they are tailoring a lot of their bills and a lot of their policies to help out the people at the wealthy end of the spectrum, but they are very, very harsh when it comes to people at the lower end of the spectrum, and this bill reflects exactly that. There are um, uh, actually, just coming back to the issue that was, that was um, that was brought forward by the New Zealand Law Society, I should say. I think I said an error before it was the Law Commission, but it was the New Zealand Law Society that brought this issue before the Select Committee. Um, we do accept the argument by the New Zealand Law Society that in the absence of a positive act, which would normally provide ground for criminal liability, the justification for making partners and spouses criminally liable is not apparent. And Labor would support amendments to this bill for new provisions that aligned with the advice of the New Zealand Law Society. So we hope in the course of this debate we will have uh, a debate around amendments that would actually deal with the issues brought forward by the, by the Law Society because they are important issues. They are important because not only do they set a precedent, but in the context of this bill dealing with people who are down on their luck, Let's be quite frank about this. People who end up relying on a welfare, on, on welfare payments to keep themselves going are down on their luck. People who are committing corporate tax fraud cannot be described as being down on their luck normally. Normally, they actually have got a lot of opportunity, a lot of options in front of them, and what they choose to do is, actually, is, is act fraudulently. can be no excuse for that whatsoever. And yet the government seems completely soft on that level of offending. Um, Mr Chair, there's a lot of, um, a lot of uh, discussion in this part of the, of the bill about um, who are spouses and who they're not. A lot of discussion and definitions that actually uh, help us to try and make decisions about whether they're captured by this, this act, or the, sorry, this bill, um, which will become an act or not. Um, but the reality is that we don't have nearly the same amount of, uh, of liability when it comes to other fraud measures. And it's certainly the Labour Party's view that if we're going to go down this track, then we want to be consistent about it. We don't want the cherry-picking that this, this government is so well known for, where they're favouring people with lots of resources and, um, and rolling out the, you know, the good old beneficiary bashing whenever they're in a spot of trouble, because that certainly has been the habit of this government. We've um, just had in the last week, we've had the uh, Minister of Social Development um, decide that she's going to release information that would give New Zealanders the impression that loads of beneficiaries are off sunning themselves at Club Med every week. That that's, that's you know, another, another level of, I think she's trying to say, benefit fraud that's been committed. And it wasn't interesting that even in a couple of the provincial newspapers have picked this up, 
that it was actually irresponsible of the Minister to release that information without divulging all of the information. So, for example, for the people who have travelled overseas who have beneficiaries in uh, the period since July, we have no idea how many of them um, are still away because they've been looking for work. Uh, Jacinta Ardern. Thank you, Mr Chair. It's my um, pleasure.